also we see that the akhlaq of Khadija radhiallahu anha her personality I mean, think about it a woman who has been widowed twice she works herself she has her business all right typically a woman like this how would her nature be i don't need men i don't need to be married who needs a man i'm a man i'm better than a man right i'm fully independent you see that softness in her she's not harsh she's still soft and we see that even more when she's married to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because generally when we go through difficulties in life we think that we have to be very rough and tough and crude and and harsh and and we shouldn't feel like a woman and we don't need to cry and and loving someone or or getting married i mean these are weaknesses and i should be above these weaknesses no if you're a woman be a woman allah made you like that and we see that in khadija radhiallahu anha and we see that khadija radhiallahu anha was the first wife of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he never married another woman while she was alive which means that after prophethood many years the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spent with her only when she passed away a few months after that did he get married to someone else and she became the mother of all his children except for ibrahim right all his children who qasim zainab ruqayya um kulthum fatima abdullah and we see that all the boys they died in infancy or childhood and the girls they grew up they got married they embraced islam they they did hijra and three of them died during the lifetime of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but fatima died after right she died 6 months after the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam loved khadija radhiallahu anha so much that just one thing is is enough to tell us how much he loved her it is said that when khadija radhiallahu anha died the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not seen smiling for several weeks for several weeks he was not seen smiling so anyway allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed him with this big blessing beautiful companionship with khadija radhiallahu anha and fast forward now 10 years later when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was married to khadija radhiallahu anha when he was around 35 years old So after 10 years of marriage with Khadija radhiallahu anha what happened the Kaaba it was damaged by a fire and a flood right there was a woman who was cooking close to the Kaaba and at that time houses were very close to the Kaaba all right so a woman was cooking and what happened one of the sparks all right it fell on the cover of the Kaaba and it it caught fire so due to the fire what happened the walls of the Kaaba they were slightly destroyed and then there was a flood also soon after that so amazing fire and then flood and why a flood because where is the kaaba situated in a valley all right and what is around the kaaba mountains now you don't see the mountains all right but before there were mountains so obviously when there is mountains on the sides and it rains where will the water end up where in the valley so the kaaba was flooded now firstly because of the fire and now because of the flood what happened the kaaba its walls were basically destroyed so the kaaba had to be reconstructed so the quraysh they took up this responsibility to reconstruct the kaaba now what happened the quraysh i mean they were wealthy they were people of makka but when you compare uh the arabs with the rest of the civilizations of that time the arabs were not very well off all right and also if you think about it in makka in arabia in the desert what wood would you have any prime wood good good quality wood no stone i mean yes there is many rocky mountains however you would need equipment you would need the resources and the skills in order to get that stone in or in order to get that rock so the quraysh they wanted to rebuild the kaaba but they lacked resources now what happened that one of the roman kings he was getting a church reconstructed where in yemen where is yemen south of hijaz all right and he was sending the materials from somewhere else to yemen by sea all right what happened the ship crashed 
There was a storm, the ship crashed, and all these fancy, good quality materials are on that ship. What happened? It crashed near the port of Judda. Now it is Jeddah. All right? And there were craftsmen, skilled workers, all right? And the resources, everything on that ship. That ship crashes. And now the people, they have to get back home. So they say, you know what? Sell everything so that at least we have enough money to get back home. So there is literally a sale going on in Judda of these fancy, good quality materials. So what happened? The Quraysh went to Judda, bought those materials, and also hired the craftsmen. And they brought them into Mecca to reconstruct the Kaaba. But when they had to reconstruct the Kaaba, obviously they had to break down the walls that were already destroyed. They had to bring the building down. And that was something that they were scared to do. I mean, think about it, the Kaaba, breaking the Kaaba. Even if it was for a noble reason, it's something scary, right? So they hesitated. And then a man from among them, Walid bin Mughira, he said, you know what? We're doing this for a just cause. We're doing islah over here. Allah will not destroy us. Allah will not be upset with us. So he started. When he started bringing down the wall, and the people were just watching him. They were scared to do it themselves. And when they saw nothing happened to Walid bin Mughira, they said, okay, that means we can do it as well. Right? It is said that they waited for one night to see what would happen to Walid bin Mughira. The next day when they found him perfectly safe and sound, they said, okay, inshallah, we can also continue. So they began demolishing the Kaaba and they reconstructed the Kaaba. And because this was a very noble task, what the tribes agreed to do was that each group is going to be, each tribe is going to be assigned a particular task. All right. So the Prophet ﷺ, his tribe or his sub-tribe was also assigned a very noble task, which was to work on one particular wall of the Kaaba, the side of which, the corner of which was the Hajar Aswad. All right, now the wall is being built. Now when it comes to Hajar Aswad, the black stone, there is a dispute. All right, each group wants to place the black stone themselves. So great was this dispute that the construction stopped for five days. All right, for five days, no construction. And the Banu Mahzum, this is a tribe of Abu Jahl. They said they basically dipped their hands in blood. All right, what does that mean? They're signing. This is like a pledge. And they said, we're not going to let anyone place the black stone. We're going to do it. We are the only ones who are going to do it. And if somebody else does it, we're going to fight. We're going to fight until there's bloodshed. But we're not going to give this privilege to anybody. So there was a man in Makkah, Abu Umayyah. He was the oldest man of Makkah. All right. And he said that, you know what? Stop this fighting. This is not correct. You're doing a noble task as much as you want to have this privilege, but this should not end up in bloodshed. And he said that from this main entrance into the haram, whoever walks in now, whoever walks in, the first person to walk in will do exactly what he tells us. And who was that man? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He walked in. And when he walked in and he saw everybody wanted to have the privilege to place the black stone, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He took an izar. What is izar? A lower garment. So like a like, like a rectangular piece of cloth, the hajar was placed in it. One representative from each tribe picked up, you know, held a corner or a side of that sheet and they took the hajar aswad to the place where it had to be uh, fixed and the Prophet ﷺ fixed the black stone. What do we see over here? Huh? Okay, his intelligence. How? Exactly. He didn't say, oh, okay, I can do this myself. Right? I'm not going to let anybody else do this. I'm going to do this myself. He wasn't selfish over here. Again, we see the Prophet ﷺ was not a selfish man in any way. All right? He was very concerned about the feelings of people. He was sensitive towards the feelings of people. And he knew, he he understood how badly each person wanted to have this privilege. Now, if he would give one tribe the opportunity, the others would feel deprived. They, they would feel left out. Look at how he made everyone participate. This is a leader, right? Everyone is getting a chance. And you see, the Prophet ﷺ, 
This was the way that he dealt with people. Each person felt he was important. Each person felt he was beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the case before prophethood and even after prophethood. That the companions thought literally that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved them the most. He cared for them the most. And we see this before prophethood and after prophethood. So anyway, the the construction of the Kaaba was completed. But remember that the Quraysh, they ran out of the materials. All right, because the Kaaba, it was huge. All right. And it was meant to be a rectangular shaped structure. So because they ran out of the materials, what did they do? They built a square shape. All right. And they left a part of it unconstructed. They left it open, but they put marks over there. And this is where the Hatim is today. You know, the semicircle that you see right by the Karva. So why do you think people fight so much to get inside the Hatim and pray there? Because that is supposed to be part of the Karva. All right. And the, and the Quraysh, when they reconstructed the Karva, they also uh, placed the door uh, high above ground level. Why? Because they didn't want anybody to enter the Karba without permission. They also put a roof, a, a ceiling on top, and they also put pillars inside to hold the roof. And they also doubled the height. They made it bigger. And subhanAllah, it is still like that today. Even though the Kaaba has been reconstructed many times, but today it is this way as well. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the Prophet ﷺ by giving him the chance to place the black stone in the Kaaba. Right? This raised a status amongst his people. And the people also appreciated him even more. Why? Because he did not leave them out. He gave them a chance to participate. And remember that Hajar Aswad, the black stone, is, is no ordinary stone. You might wonder, what's the big deal? Why were they so you know, greedy for that opportunity? The fact is that Hajar Aswad, it is a very, very precious stone, you can say. It is the most precious stone. Because in a hadith we learn that there is nothing of Jannah upon this world except the black stone. So if you want to see something of Jannah, then what should you look at? The black stone. This is a hadith which is in Asil Sayyid Sahihah, authenticated by Shaykh Al-Bani. It is from Jannah, the stone. And it was originally whiter than snow. So now today when you go and you look at the snow and you're amazed by how white it is, remember that Hajar Aswad was even whiter than snow. And what caused it to blacken was the sins of the people of shirk. Kissing the stone erases sins. And Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that I have seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kissing the stone, so I will not refrain from kissing it, neither in difficulty nor in ease. Meaning, I don't care what's going on. Whenever I get a chance, I'm going to kiss this stone. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kissed this stone. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that, oh, 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 oh stone, you are only a stone. You don't harm nor do you benefit. Had I not seen the Prophet ﷺ kissing you, I would not have kissed you. And he said, Umar who also said at one occasion that I, I saw the Prophet ﷺ, he was bika hafiya. He liked you, O stone. The Prophet ﷺ used to like you. So I also like you because Rasulullah ﷺ liked you. So look at the eagerness of the Sahaba, how much they like the black stone and how much they wanted to kiss it as well. Why? Because this is from Jannah. And uh, look at the eagerness of Ibn Umar. That I don't care whether it's difficult or it's easy. I am going to kiss the black stone. So when you go for Umrah or for Hajj, you know, make that niyyah. I'm, I'm going to make sure I do it. And one of the best times to go and kiss the black stone is when it is extremely hot. When it is extremely hot, when the sun is right on top of your head. Alright, between Zuhur and Asr. Or before Zuhur, in summertime. That's one of the best times to go. Why? Because when you will go, there is hmm, few people. Alright. And as soon as a group of women approach, then Alhamdulillah, they accommodate. And then once the women go in, then the men have to kind of stay away. Alright. Alhamdulillah. It's just, just a, uh, a trick. So you can inshallah get there as well when you go. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ, he constructed the Kaaba. And remember that at this occasion what happened, that he was carrying the materials, uh, you know, heavy stones and the planks of wood on his shoulder. And he was using his sheet, his, clo- his clothes 
to cover his shoulder so that he would place the heavy materials on his shoulder. And at one occasion what happened that he lifted up his cloth in order to place it on his other shoulder and his aura got exposed. And he was heard saying, O Muhammad وسلم, cover yourself. So the Prophet وسلم, immediately threw the stone down, not the black stone, the stones that he was carrying on his shoulder and he covered himself and he was never seen naked after this. This is reported in Muslim Ahmad. So we see the noble character of the Prophet وسلم, over here. How chaste he was, how how concerned he was for all people, how trustworthy he was, and his akhlaq was definitely very noble. And we see this through his life. He was patient at times of hardship. He was grateful for what he had. He was committed to his work. He was humble. And Abu Talib, he said in the praise of the Prophet ﷺ, this is reported in Bukhari, أَبْيَضْ يُسْتَسْقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ سِمَالُ الْيَتَامَ عِسْمَةُ لِلْأَرَامِلِ the Prophet ﷺ, he's faultless, meaning he's fair and handsome. And from his face, mercy falls like rain. He's a support for the orphans, a defense for the widows, meaning he does not let anyone harm widows and orphans. We see this in his noble character. And also remember that the Prophet ﷺ, before prophethood even, he never committed idolatry. He kept away from idolatry, from all, from all shirk. He did not participate in any kind of battle, zina, drinking. He he was always away from this. We learn in the hadith in Musnad Ahmad that one of the neighbors of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying to Khadija, "By Allah, I will never worship Lat. Lat is one of the idols. By Allah, I will never worship Uzza." In another hadith, which is also in Musnad Ahmad, we learned that Zaid bin Harith. I remember that he was a young boy as a slave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his freed slave. He said that there was an idol by the name of Isaf and Naila near the Kaaba. And when the people would be doing tawaf, they would touch these idols. So he said that once I was doing tawaf with the Prophet ﷺ, this is before prophethood. All right? And he says that I touched one of the idols. So Muhammad ﷺ said to me, do not touch them. So he said, I thought in my heart, I want to touch them and I'm going to try again. So he said, next round of tawaf, I, again, I touch the idol. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said to me, did I not stop you? Did I not tell you not to do this? Not to touch the idols? So we see that he kept away from idolatry himself and he also did not allow his family to participate in this. He never touched an idol. He never touched an idol. And we see that along with this, he was also very truthful, very trustworthy. Jafar, he said to Hiraqal that until Allah sent us a messenger whose lineage, truthfulness, trustworthiness, and chastity we are aware of. Meaning he's, he's known for his truthfulness. And we see that even during this time, the Prophet ﷺ kept fasts. You know that? He used to observe fasting. Because remember that even though shirk was rampant in that society, there were still some people who were known as the Hunafa. Who were the Hunafa? People who did not commit shirk. Alright? People who did not worship idols. They believed in Allah alone and they worshipped Allah alone. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ, all his characteristics were noble. Whether they were inner or outer. His akhlaq, his character, very noble. And even outer characteristics, his physical traits also, very beautiful and very handsome. And for this, I would like you to do some homework because it is important to know what the Prophet ﷺ looked like. Would you like to know? What was his appearance like? And for this, please read the pages 317. I don't know if, if your book has the same page numbers, but there is a section of this book which describes the physical uh, characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. And also, one more thing you have to do, which is that you have to listen to a lecture that I will send you the link of. All right, the physical appearance of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Inshallah, I will send you the link. Inshallah. So these are the two homeworks that you have to do for your next class. Inshallah. Subhanakallahu bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.